Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good afternoon and good evening to all our guests and, and colleagues viewing online. My name is Jacob Kurtzer. I'm director and senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies Humanitarian Agenda. We're grateful for your taking the time to join us for this very important conversation on the humanitarian situation in Afghanistan. All of you who are joining us today are well aware of the dire need uh, the dire humanitarian conditions facing the civilian population of Afghanistan. Um, the complexity of the humanitarian challenges there uh, really challenge the ability and challenge our thinking in terms of how to navigate the various different interests at play in terms of meeting the immediate and long-term needs of the Afghan civilian population without empowering and emboldening uh, ruling uh, Taliban who are committing, as we speak, um, grave violations of human rights and causing even further humanitarian deterioration. To try to unpack these questions, we have a, a really esteemed panel, and I'm grateful for our, our colleagues for joining us today. Uh, Ms. Seema Samar uh, is a former Afghan state minister for human rights and international affairs and currently sits on the United Nations Secretary General's high-level panel on internal displacement. In addition to that role, she sits on the Secretary General's advisory board on mediation and was chairperson of the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission. Ms. Shaowei Li is the Deputy Country Director of Operations for the World Food Program in Afghanistan, and previously served with USAID and worked with WFP in South Sudan, Thailand, India, Pakistan, and Italy prior to her current assignment. And Mr. Hardin Lang is Vice President for Programs and Policy at Refugees International, a veteran of multiple United Nations peacekeeping missions and humanitarian field missions, and uh, one of the most collaborative colleagues for myself here in Washington. Um, we're hopefully gonna be joined by Ms. Fazia Kufi as well, um, but why don't we just get started? I wanna um, start with you, Ms. Samar, and thank you again for taking the time and, and sharing your thoughts with us. Um, we, Afghanistan has experienced humanitarian need for a very, very long time. Um, even prior to the events of this summer, um, humanitarian organizations were warning about a deterioration in the overall conditions. How do you see, though, a change in what's happened since August and the departure of the United States? How do you look at the current humanitarian crisis and how does it differ from what we what we observed and what you and um, and other Afghans experienced prior to this, and are there lessons that can be learned from how the international community responded pre-August for the way that we should be thinking about responding to the situation now? Yep. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for including me. Let me uh, make one correction. That is that the the panel, the high level panel for IDP is finished, so I'm not anymore. Uh, member or uh, we, we have done our work. So that is the end of uh, September. Uh, well, I think I would start by saying that unfortunately the situation in, Af in Afghanistan or the case in Afghanistan is a collective failure. Collective failure of Afghan government and Afghan people, including myself, and also the uh, failure of international community leading by the US. So uh, one of the reason was the, there was lack of a strategy, long-term strategy or multi-dimension strategy to deal with Afghanistan generally. And of course, uh, not finishing the job in Afghanistan, going to Iraq was diverting all the attention to another country in fact, I have to say that both countries are suffering or even more countries are suffering from the, um, I would say short term vision and approach to, uh, to the different country. Uh, the, the other point that the, uh, the tolerance for the corruption in Afghanistan and also in Iraq and some other countries in conflict by the international community 
was uh, really giving the space or preparing the environment for uh, failure of, of, uh, of the structure of the governance in the country. Of course, lack of uh, good governance, lack of rule of law and so on is, is uh, a difficulty. Um, I have to say that the, the pro problem in Afghanistan started 44 years ago with violation of human rights. So when, they, when the coup d'etat was happened in 1979, they started to violate the people's human rights. So the people start to fight against that government and finally against the invasion of the Russian and so on. Uh, so the, the whole issue of human rights is somehow undermined by a lot of other people. So what I would say in the last 44 years, yes, we were always in emergency cases which is really bothers me that every time we were in emergency in 1990s, when I was talking about education and, and health, they were saying it's development project. These are, Afghanistan is an emergency case. We are an emergency case. But I think one of the lessons that we should learn that we should either take Afghanistan or any other countries, not look at emergency case, not look only for quick fix programs. It should be a long-term, it should be, uh, uh, on human rights based approach. Currently the people, uh, I mean, yes, we were in a humanitarian uh, disasters, but the current situation is really high. And we have not only one crisis, the humanitarian crisis, but we have other crises. I um, shortly touch on it. One is political crisis in the country. Political crisis and lack of trust and stability in the country put the people in a post situation that they cannot decide what to do. And that is, if you look at the family, when they are, everybody know, doesn't know what to do, then the whole family structure is falling. So the, currently the people of Afghanistan in that, uh, unfortunately, uh, fortunately in that crisis. So that political crisis is, is really putting people, make people more vulnerable than any other year previous years in the country. The second point is that yes, Taliban took over the country, but uh, again, I would blame everyone. Uh, as I said before, with the uh, lack of uh, proper pro policy or a strategy, but taking the territory or the country is one thing. Governing the people is another issue, which is lacking. It's a, uh, it's four times that the Taliban went to my house. Yesterday they went and they went to take the house. They searched the house, they took the car, they took the gun. I had three bodyguards from them, but now they're sitting there and saying that we want a house. So this is not kind of government, governance in the country. So taking my house and what is my crime? Because I was defending that the Taliban should not be tortured when they are in detention center. Taliban or any, any other human being. I was standing against that penalty. Should I be tortured again by Taliban because I was doing that? So there's lack of justice, lack of accountability in the country. The second crisis is the, of course, the poverty and the humanitarian crisis. People were poor before that. And because of the, uh, because of the, uh, drought, already a lot of people were displaced, but the conflict or the war increased, intensified during the harvest. People could not uh, collect their harvest, whatever they had. For example, in the Northern Afghanistan, they have this watermelon and melon, good quality melon and watermelon. They could not collect them. They were busy, they were displaced. So it uh, increased more displacement in the country which is also uh, adding to the humanitarian disaster. The lack of uh, job opportunity for the people. People do not get paid. Uh, for example, we have 120,000 teachers, they are not getting paid. The, the doctors and the medical staff does not get paid. I mean, you name it, NGO staff, banking system is not working. So the whole issue increase and increase on the, Instability and also, of course, on the on the um, poverty uh, increase of poverty. 
And then, of course, the lack of uh, uh, lack of rule of law and uh, justice. So the whole justice system doesn't work. Prosecutors are not there. The police are not there. The legal system is collapsed. Everybody is doing on their own way. The third crisis that the people face is because of COVID which already put people in a very difficult situation. What has happened actually, increased the violence against women, increased poverty among women household, um, uh, breadwinner of the family, and increased the uh, poverty and, and uh, um, I would say, uh, reduced their social space yeah. and, and uh, Increased child marriage, increased child uh, forced marriage, selling children because the family is selling one daughter in order to feed the others. Increased on forced prostitution, unsafe abortion and unsafe delivery, increased the mother, mother and child mortality rate. So that's why this time the humanitarian crisis is different from the previous one. Yeah. Or let's say in 2016, 2017, they were saying a lot of people would depend on the, on the humanitarian aid. But this is more severe. Thanks. Majority of the people are depend on the humanitarian. Thank I stop you it. very much. Um, I want to, you spoke about a long history of need and, and these overlapping crises. And in particular, I want to I turn to you, Ms. Lee, um, from the perspective of the, of the World Food Program. Because one of the things that Minister Samar mentioned was the, the lack of governance capacity amongst those who have taken over the, the country. And so from your perspective, um, can you tell us a little bit about the food crisis in particular, but also about how an organization like the World Food Program is able to respond to this massive need in an environment um, where the governance capacity is essentially completely absent? Sure, thank you. Um, so first of all, I'll start with where the situation currently lies. As a result of both a combination of drought, um, as well as significant displacement over the past couple of years, due to also partially drought, as well as the conflict situation, and then this economic crisis, what we've seen is now um, a projection for November now, um, of 22.8 million people who are acutely food insecure. So that's, that, that's almost 23 million people, over half of the population, who don't have enough food to eat and go hungry. Um, and what is more worrying also is the level of severity. Um, around almost 9 million people of that 23 are what we would consider to be an emergency um, phase of levels of food insecurity. And so we've been having to respond to that. And I, I would say there are a number of factors that really are critical for that response. One is to be able to be forward looking. Um, we anticipated because of the drought that we saw coming, um, that there would be significant increases in people who are hungry. And so for months, we had already been um, looking at our procurements, getting food in. And the result of that is in August, uh, we, were, we had served, so August is still normally part of the harvest period. Normally our response would be low. Um, and in August, we served 1.3 million people. In September, we were able to reach 4 million people, which was almost a threefold increase. And then most recently in October, we reached 5 million. We're incrementally um, increasing that. So in November, our plan is around 8.5 million. Um, and then into next year, our aim is to be able to reach 20 something million. In order to do that though, it also requires a significant amount of funding up front so that we can prepare and procure our food in advance. Um, you asked also about the winter. The winter is the harshest period, um, both because this is normally the season when they're not able to harvest, um, but also in these very harsh areas, uh, it's also when people have the greatest needs. We have pre-positioned food um, in advance. So a lot of locations, the paths basically cut off by mid-November. And we've been pre-positioning, looking at another 25,000 metric tons that we would get to people in advance of the winter. 
what we ultimately need, um, so one, when I talked about forward looking, that also is really robust data analysis. So for WFP, we, we work with other partners in collecting data and then just really having credible analysis and data. And that ultimately is informs both our programming as well as for everybody else to know how to respond, including our donors. We also really look at our humanitarian principles. In order for us to do what we do, we have to abide by the four main humanitarian principles of neutrality, impartiality, operational independence, um, and humanity. By doing so, it allows us to be able to have community engagement on the ground, uh, knowing that we're objective in what we do, that then leads, lends to access. So for us, we have been able to work in Afghanistan across all 34 provinces, whether it was Taliban controlled in the past or government, the former government control. And it's because of that objectivity and impartiality. I would also just add two other points. One is that we do also, especially going forward, need to be very careful and nuanced in our response. Yes, I've talked about a very large scale, but at the same time, we need to know which mechanisms and modalities to respond. What I mean by that is there may be a lot of discussions about a massive cash injection into the economy to try to stimulate the economy, but we need to be careful that if a big cash injection is is made that it doesn't contribute to inflation. We're already seeing significant inflation in, in food prices. Um, and then lastly, it would just to be agile in our response. Um, we have the ability as the World Food Program to be able to provide in-kind food assistance when necessary, and then to be able to provide cash or voucher assistance as need be. And similarly, our response has now also looked at an increase in urban because the urban population has been so affected by the recent economic um, crisis. And so it's a lot of that flexibility, as well as looking at seasonality, um, where you know during the harvest period, we would reduce our assistance. During the lean season, we would increase. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a real comprehensive. And um, I wanted to now turn to you, Hardin. Um, I want to just start as we look at at the needs and the picture, if you can tell us a little bit about displacement, both internally in Afghanistan and, and in the neighboring countries, what does is, what is that situation look like right now? Um, there's obviously a lot of focus on the needs inside of Afghanistan, but we know even prior to August, there are refugees in neighboring countries. And, and how is that picture um, playing out? Um, should, we, should we anticipate another potential um, spike in movements and how does that inform the way we think about um, a coherent response? Jake, great question. Thanks very much. And, and thanks very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, and I also just want to say it's an honor to be here today, particularly with uh, Minister Samar. When I first started working in Afghanistan back in 2005, it was um, just a real honor to watch all of the work that she had put in, both to the Ministry of Women's Affairs, but also the Afghan Independent uh, Human Rights Commission, which was a sort of extraordinary work that was being done in very difficult circumstances. Um, what I would say about the refugee situation, um, I think most uh, on, on this call will probably be aware of the fact that there are about 2.6 million Afghan refugees or long-term refugees uh, who have been built up over a number of years, mostly in surrounding countries, neighboring countries, for example, in Afghanistan and in Pakistan, uh, where most stay. I'm sorry, I'm in Pakistan and in Iran at the moment. But what I would say is the, there were some projections back in August uh, in early September looking at what could be a very significant outflow of refugees was anticipated, mostly built up around the fighting that was occurring over the summer. And those worst case scenarios were looking at about 500,000 refugees moving into Iran and moving into Pakistan. We have not seen those numbers materialize today. In fact, to date, so far this year, there are about under 40,000 Afghan new refugees this year uh, in Iran, Pakistan, and Tajikistan. Now, the actual number of people is probably a little bit higher than that, given that a number of people have crossed regularly, but that's where we are on the formal number. So why is this? Um, you know, part of the reason why the numbers are probably reasonably low at the moment is the Taliban takeover was very swift and it was accomplished without protracted fighting uh, in population centers. And while the Taliban had taken a number of repressive steps, particularly with respect to women, uh, the immediate threat of physical violence for many Afghans is not as severe as it could have been. 
And the second region, uh, reason we probably aren't seeing major outflows is uh, when you interview refugees who have made their way into Pakistan, there are a number who will say that they have been harassed, beaten, or extorted by Taliban officials as they were trying to make their way out. So there looks like to be a concerted effort by the Taliban to keep people from leaving the country. And finally, um, neighboring countries have largely formally closed their borders to Afghans. In Pakistan, um, the government is only allowing Afghans to cross who have uh, valid travel or work documents or are traveling for medical reasons. Uh, in Iran, uh, the government has limited the entry to Afghans with valid passports and visas, but even then, Iran's border crossing points have generally been closed to Afghan asylum seekers. So what that leaves us with is a picture of forced displacement around, in and around Afghanistan remains largely internal in the, like the last couple of months. The total number of Afghans forced to flee their homes uh, this year uh, is about 660,000. Um, that brings the total number of, in, of internally displaced to about 3.5 million. Um, what I would say, though, is given the speed at which the humanitarian situation is deteriorating inside of Afghanistan, particularly listening to the comments made about what's going on on the food front um, and the proximity of winter arriving, I think it's fair to say that a large number of Afghans may yet still try to seek safety or refuge in neighboring countries. Perhaps not as high as the half a million worst case scenario that the UN had projected, but I think it's still going to be significant. Thanks a lot, Hardin. And, um, and I want to, as we we frame this conversation around the question of conditionality, and there's a lot of complications with respect to the international community's relationship with Iran, the United States' relationship with the Taliban. But I want to come back to to you, Mr. Samar, and some of the issues that you started to raise at the at the end of your comments, in particular around the rights of women and girls, and and some of the um, uh, atrocities and challenges that that um, people are facing now, uh, because this speaks to what I think is the vexing challenge you know we're thinking about in Washington about how do we how do we support people without empowering um, the forces and 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 those that we don't we don't want to give support to. But can you can you talk a little bit about the severity of the situation? Um, facing um, women and girls in Afghanistan right now, and you know, from from your experience, you know, what are things that the international community can do? What are things that the United States can do in a context like this, where it feels like our options are very limited? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yes, I think uh, um, unfortunately, Taliban is also the reality of the country. Um, we need to pressurize Taliban to facilitate uh, the provision of humanitarian services to the people. I think that uh, we should not really watch the crisis, the human cri humanitarian crisis in the country to continue. The way we saw, I think, the first days in August and during the evacuation. So that shows how desperate the people are and the people who are standing behind the doors of the neighboring countries. I mean, uh, I, I personally believe that the, the number of the refugees must, must be much higher uh, in our neighboring countries because, I mean, a lot of people are afraid to be, uh, to be uh, on the list to be registered because Pakistan or Iran, both of them are really acting harshly. I know one of my close relatives yesterday was taken, was stopped by the police in Pakistan yesterday and take everything was taken, including his rings. So it, because he didn't have his passport with him. So whatever money he had in his pocket was taken. Um, so that is the reality. And it's already say that they, of course, Pakistan is supportive of Taliban. So the people, this is not the same situation as for example, in the 80s when I was refugee in Pakistan. Uh, so it is uh, difficult for the people. The, the other point that I would like to mention clearly, um, Taliban is not united uh, group because in the Northern Afghanistan, for example, they allow the girls to go to uh, um, uh, schools above seventh grade but in, this, in the other part of the country is not allowed. In some of the part of the country, they allow the women to work on some specific issue, things in only on, on health sector, 
but in some other um, part, they do not allow the, the women to work. And then Baudrys, for example, or in Roar, they put a lot of restriction on the women. Although like Daikundi and Bamiyan is much open to this issue than the other cases. So I think the, the um, United, Nation, United States and United Nation also can choose a better way not to empower the Taliban, not to recognize Taliban, but to, to give the support to the people. I give you an example, I think. Uh, UNICEF can pay the teacher salary without really involving Taliban. So directly to the teachers, that is one way. So it can be given a possibility for women to, uh, for the teachers to have a living, to have a, a hope that they will get something to, to look at, uh, for a better future in the country. Um, our colleague from WFP is here. I think WFP also can use the, the food distribution in a, in a, a dignified way, I would say, that depending people on the on the relief is also something very, very difficult. And, and it, I mean, it, it's really destroyed the, I would say, the, the pride of the people, the, the ownership of the people, they depend on the, so they can use food for work, for, for even for the women, food for um, em embroideries or food for handicraft, food for education, food for other um, issues for the men. They can, you know, of course, use that food for work for in different small projects here and there. Uh, some um, to to give the people kind of a hope and pride that they are uh, resilience also that they can live that way. And if WHO, through WHO, if they can pay the health, uh, the people who are in the health services, instead of giving the money to the, um, to the government or to the Taliban, so-called uh, Taliban. Uh, so that is, uh, um, that is an issue. I think we also have to, to raise our voice against the crimes committed by them. Uh, we, I mean, we see some kind of uh, apologetic uh, uh, comments and, and a statement by different people tries to say that yes, Afghanistan is a traditional country. Yes, it is a traditional country. These days I'm giving the example of Halloween and killing women because they were rich. So should we continue that kind of tradition? And Afghanistan is a traditional country, so we should excuse the tradition of Afghanistan not to promote human rights and equality or gender equality in the country. So things like that should be clearly said and, and we should be loud against the crimes committed by them and also for accountability. Thank you very much, Minister Samar. I mean, there's a, a lot of different pieces of that that I'd like to pick up on. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you hard and hold on the thought on the payments for UNICEF and WHO because I wanna ask you about that in a minute, but I'm gonna come to you first, Ms. Lee and, and uh, Minister Samar talked about, um, you know, the the dignity and the questions about dependence. And you talked a little bit in your first answer about um, about planning and looking ahead and the drought conditions you had you had prepositioned. And I'm wondering, a lot of our attention now is focused on the emergency response, and there is clearly a need to scale up an emergency response. But we also know that the environmental conditions are such that even if we can make it through this wave, we're going to be looking at food insecurity for a long time. How does how can WFP and its you know its supporters and partners in the international community think about both responding to the immediate terms, but also trying to break that cycle of dependency and thinking about working to to alleviate the food insecurity needs in, in Afghanistan in the long term. Um, yes, absolutely. I think that's a very important question. And I think one of the first and foremost um, is what Minister Samara had mentioned and really looking at the people and in a dignified response. If we were to look at it from that perspective, I think it would, it's not, it is the immediate needs that are required, but then over time, what can we do? 
for what we see right now in Afghanistan is that there was a massive drought in 2018 and people didn't have really the support nor the proper time to be able to build back properly until they were, um, and then they were hit by another drought this year. And so what we really need to look at is what can we already do um, so that it will take time. It will take a few years for people to build back assets, food stocks that they've lost. Um, but those are things that WFP continues to maintain as a priority, despite the massive humanitarian need. Um, and just in a couple of examples, WFP provides support kind of along the spectrum um, for a food system from production um, and harvest. So also looking at different ways to help increase productivity. Water management, of course, is a very um, important one in Afghanistan, uh, but it's also not only drought, but also um, floods. Even in July this year, late July, there was a massive flash flood, for example. So what WFP um, has worked with, with communities is building community infrastructures like check dams, for example, and then also be able to look at irrigation canals for greater productivity um, on farms. What, um, as, as well as looking at you know, different new technologies such as hydroponics, um, greenhouses, and other agro um, forestry practices. Um, we also look at how we can help with restoring degraded soil and environment. And what I mean is, so planting of trees, afforestation, for example, um, other water and soil con conservation techniques, for example, um, micro sheds. Um, so those are kind of the, the aspects that we can help on the production side. We also look at beyond production, um, kind of along the spectrum, to encourage productivity and production, we're also looking at local purchases. As WFP, we buy a lot of food and we'd also try to buy as much of it locally as possible. Um, in Afghanistan right now, even now, despite the, or maybe more so because of the economic crisis, we're buying 25,000 metric tons of wheat flour locally milled um, per month. Not all of that is necessarily produced in Afghanistan, but it helps with the local economy. We also provide assistance um, with post-harvest losses um, so that really it's not just the production, but we're looking at also making sure that we maximize the amount that is produced. Um, and, and then lastly, it's looking at climate change. Of course, no one actor can help solve that problem alone. So we're looking at complementarities and partnerships that we might be able to have with others. Um, at the moment, we're in discussions, um, certainly with our UN sister agencies, as well as organizations like Aga Khan Foundation and others to really look at how we can help support. Thanks. Um, you know, this, this idea of buying locally, you talked about the assets, we, we understand the economic challenges. And, and again, this question about um, the vexing challenge here is one where we, you know, even if the international community partners, UN agencies wanted to work, there still exist sanctions and other restrictive measures that prohibit certain kinds of engagements in Afghanistan with the Taliban or, or in areas controlled by the Taliban or other designated groups. Um, and there's this question that I think a lot of people are, are wrestling with of, you know, money going into the country and how does that, you know, how does that potentially em embolden um, the Taliban? And, and this question about assets and the economic issues, right? Uh, we talked about UNICEF. I think Minister Samar mentioned UNICEF has announced a plan to directly pay teachers and, and bypass. And um, WHO as well, I think, is working on a, on, on a similar process for the health system. But at the end of the day, people need to have economic activity and people need to be able to purchase for themselves to, to live in dignity and to revitalize the economic condition. So I wanna to turn to you, Hardin, and ask you about this question. I mean, we've talked about inflation, but we also know people can't access cash, that reserves are being held by the United States. And so how do we, what can we think about, what are some, some ideas or, or ways to think about getting currency flowing to Afghans um, but ensuring that it doesn't fall into the wrong hands, because I think we can all agree that 
you know, allowing organic economic activity to regenerate is, is a necessary precondition for alleviating some of the humanitarian conditions. Jake, thanks very much. I mean, I think that's the real, that's one of the big strategic questions are sort of facing the, both the immediate and then the medium to longer term of Afghanistan at the moment. You know, we talk about the amount of money uh, that used to be in the Afghan economy. So if you think about the 9.5 billion, right, that were reserves that, uh, that have now been frozen, or you think collectively about the close to 7 billion in aid that came from the US and the West, the rest of the West, you know, most of that is gone because of sanctions and some policy decisions, the freezing of the foreign reserves. Um, we've had about 2 billion, roughly, give or take, pledged, um, both the humanitarian and other forms of assistance, um, you know, over time. But that still leaves a really big 5 billion hole. So, you know, Afghanistan has got a very significant math problem. And if we're going to try to get the economy going, that hole, if the economy isn't, we don't get the economy going, that hole is going to get even bigger. So, you um, you know, there are a couple of things that can be done, right? Actors outside of Afghanistan uh, can take a more nuanced approach to their sanctions policies. You know, these are policies that restrict the ability of the central and commercial banks to operate. And this means adjusting sanction policies so Afghan banks can provide enough cash for the economy to function um, and potentially for the central bank uh, to get enough liquidity to begin to pay some salaries for essential workers. Um, but this, urgent, this means governments need to urgently approve licenses or exemptions for humanitarian and development organizations to keep operating. And the good news is the U.S. has done some of that, right? But more is going to need to be done. The real question about the 9.5 billion in the, in the, the foreign reserves is, I'm not sure that's just a matter, though, of sanctions and adjusting uh, exemptions. And my understanding is that there are some laws in place that are going to be very difficult to turn back um, to, to allow that money to be unfrozen. So at the moment, we're trying to work around that. Uh, and, and there, when you talk about liquidity, there aren't a lot of options, right? Some, one, you said the United Nations Development Program has just announced that it's going to uh, launch a fund. I think it's already launched close to $660 million. And its primary activity or role is going to be trying to get cash into the hands of communities who are the most vulnerable. And that's going to be like cash for work. It's going to be um, attempts to provide sort of uh, uh, microfinancing or even some like uh, salary assistance for the most vulnerable uh, populations. But that's just a drop in the bucket of what needs to be done. Uh, but it's, it's the step towards some liquidity. The other question on liquidity really has to come to the form of salaries, right? And this is the program that you were talking about that UNICEF is intending to stand up to pay teacher salaries. Hopefully we get something similar that WHO can get going. I mean, there's an extraordinary program uh, called Sahad Mandi. So the, it's the partnership between what was the World Bank, um, the Ministry of Health, and then a series of international and local NGOs to provide health services. And it had a tremendous amount of sort of oversight um, and third-party scrutiny. And sort of the key there is moving the money that is in the World Bank Trust Fund, which is largely locked up and frozen, into, this, into the UNDP or another trust fund and then facilitate those payments going out to those ministries. So I think what we're going to have to see is sort of this architecture of sort of trust funds established to help pay salaries directly, largely through the UN and some NGO partners. But I think you want to do that at the same time. You still want to maintain some connectivity with these ministries, because if you don't, you're just basically going to bleed out capacity. Uh, we're going to get a much weaker space um, a couple of years from now if, if we don't if we don't maintain some of the goodness that is there inside. The other thing is I think we have to be very clear-eyed about what uh, we can do in terms of keeping sort of cash out of the hands of the, the, Tal the governing authorities and the Taliban, in the sense that, yes, this money can be channeled directly through the UN agencies and use that to pay salaries, but we're already seeing what the Taliban are doing in certain parts of the country, right, where they're going out at sort of point of gun to collect taxes. Uh, and so I think we have to accept that some of this money is, is still going to make its way into the coffers of uh, the governing authorities, but we have to be sort of clear-eyed about the, the, the challenge here. I mean, we, we can't allow like the civilian population of Afghanistan to be held hostage, right? To the sort of ongoing negotiation between the Taliban and uh, Western countries and donors about sort of governance and other forms of partnerships and human rights uh, in Afghanistan moving forward. Thanks, you know, you, you, you mentioned a lot. There's so much thinking happening now on technical solutions. And I, I'm glad you mentioned this bit at the end because, you know, I think, I and we in DC tend to focus on the US piece of this puzzle when we're looking at solutions. But you know, it, it goes without saying that the Taliban and, and their behaviors and their actions are at the crux of this problem. And we even saw the announcement about 
about currency decisions. You know, they're uh, prohibiting the use of the U.S. dollar, which is, you know, why throw in another thing into the mix when we're already dealing with such a, a, an urgent crisis? And one thing I think is interesting about the language of trust funds is the idea of trust. And and like you said at the end, there's there's going to have to be some real clear-eyed understanding of what it takes to work there. Um, and I think there has to be an even more open and honest dialogue between donors, partners, local partners uh, about accepting certain realities of working in a very complicated in- environment like um, today's Afghanistan. Um, I, I want to come back um, to you, Minister Samar. And again, you know, we when we when we think about this question, we think about um, you know doing you know. I don't say do no harm anymore. It just doesn't, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't exist in humanitarian context, in complex, you know, crisis context. There's always going to be some level of harm. But in this case, this, the question I think has, has frequently been one of balancing our human rights concerns and our humanitarian concerns. And how do we balance these equities? And, and I want, you know, from your experience, uh, experience as an Afghan, from your perspective, having you know, worked in the United Nations, worked in this panel, uh, worked on human rights issues. What are the steps that while we're trying to figure out the technical solutions for the humanitarian piece of the puzzle, what are the steps that the international community, donors, NGOs, think tanks can do to support the female human rights defenders, to support the minority populations, to support the vulnerable populations in Afghanistan you know, through words, through deeds, through actions. What what should we be thinking about doing while we're looking at those technical solutions for the humanitarian piece? Uh, yes, I think it's a, it's a, not an easy question that you ask, but I think it's not uh, impossible if we have the the um, commitment to deal with those issues. I think the I personally believe on universality of human rights and human rights as a principle for all the time. Doesn't matter where we are and if you are in an earthquake, if you are in a flooding situation or whatever. That should be our agenda to look at the issues uh, based on respect for human rights and also um, deal with the people with dignity, dignified way. So I think it is doesn't matter where we are. The reality and the truth is that the human rights defenders are the, the main um, force for promotion of human rights, particularly in difficult situation. So they have to be protected in order to be able to raise the issues. I give you some example. For example, a woman who has been the human rights defenders who was known, uh, most of them are evacuated or going to be evacuated. But people still remain in Afghanistan. And the one who is committed to remain and stay and work as a civil society, even if it's NGO, if it's they they do uh, an art, work or if they do some, uh, let's say some handicraft with women somewhere, these people should be supported because resources give them the possibility to make a space within the society. Uh, That that way they they have to be uh, supported and they have to be a clear network of, of the human rights defenders in different parts of the country. In case of emergency, they should be evacuated or they should be pro- at least put in a safe house in order to be safe from uh, being killed on the street. So those kind of actions should be taken in place. And, the, and also the one who are evacuated should be supported in order to continue their work in Afghanistan. I mean, the good part is we are, uh, I don't know if I say that we are lucky, but yes, we are lucky in a way. The difference between the current Taliban government and the previous Taliban government, I remember that we, uh, friends in in England bought a satellite telephone for, for the NGO that I was running to send to the central part of Afghanistan. They were not able to use it so that Late night, they were going in a, in a place which was far from the administration of Taliban. 
and calling, but it was so costly, $3 per minute, just calling to tell me that they are fine. So for me, hearing their voice, that was enough. Today we can we can talk with in different part of the uh, the country, so that that should be promoted and that should be really kept into the opinion that we need to support those people, give them the possibility to have access to communication, because through their communication through um, different uh, platform we can get everything almost every day. From a corner of, of Badakhshan, from the corner of Taikundi, and, and and any part of the country, and those those documentation are really important in order to pressurize the current people in power for their violation of human rights, for their arbitrary killing, arbitrary arresting of people, and and the people are so vulnerable. I mean. I, I remember when I was promoting women to be in the police, and now I feel guilty that what happened to them. And all of the, the one who has access to my number or email, they keep writing, what should we do? And it's so sad. Thank you. But Mr. I think without human rights defenders and the, uh, within the society, we cannot really promote human rights. That is clear. We, we sh they should be supported and they should be kept on the agenda for uh, future support. Uh, thank, thank you so much for that. I think it's it's fundamental that when we think about how we support the food needs and how we support the health system that we also think about um, the human rights defenders and these civil society organizations and these same things that we talk about in terms of not just the political and diplomatic support, but this technical solutions to you know, fund and assist and empower those organizations that have stayed and are committed to fighting for human rights is an incre incredibly important part of this conversation. And I was I was interested. You talked about access to information. You know, it's a one of these things that has become so essential for civilians suffering in humanitarian emergencies and a right that we fight for. And, and as you mentioned, the ability to know what's happening is crucial for us to be able to think about working and solutions. And, mm -hmm. you know, turning to you, Miss um, Lee, you, you talked a little bit about um, the attention spike, you know, the Google trends in the United States for Afghanistan, you know, it's a, it's a straight pyramid, right? It went up for four weeks from, from nothing and has gone basically down, back, back down to, to very little attention. And, you know, we do have a moment where there is sustained attention, I think, and especially in Washington, there is, there are a lot of people who want to maintain a focus on this, but we also know uh, Ethiopia, South Sudan, Venezuela, there's a lot of crises that capture people's attention and undoubtedly the needs will exist. And so how are you and your partner, UN agencies and the NGO partners planning on maintaining a spotlight and a focus on Afghanistan not just for the next six months, but, but looking to the future. Um, thank you. I think we, we actually talked about a number of the ways that we need to do so. Um, one is providing the analysis and information. What I mean by that is also not only understanding the level of food insecurity and the crisis, but also the implications. When we look at specifically food assistance um, and for, the worst case scenario for Afghanistan, of course, is looking at the possibility of starvation. I mentioned earlier the levels of um, not only in terms of numbers, but the level of food insecurity in terms of severity. The other, um, and, and um, my fellow panelists has also talked about in terms of migration, um, the choice between starvation and migration. That certainly is an area um, and topic that I think will continue to make people um, look at Afghanistan and retain an interest in Afghanistan. We also know that um, there is a possibility that if people are very hungry, they might be attracted by insurgencies, for example. What, mm -hmm. I, what we've heard is that um, the ISK is paying $200 to put up their flags in certain new areas of the country. Um, and for, for people who really don't have, in communities who really don't have the food, 
um, that might become something that is attractive. So really understanding the analysis, we're constantly monitoring the levels of food insecurity, monitoring prices to be able to share that um, with a greater and larger community. I think also we recognize that um, there may be a double La Nina um, coming up, and so there may be another drought. And it's really important for people to understand the devastation that could cause. The second, um, which I think my fellow panelists have talked quite a lot about, is um, the assurances um, of what we're doing and making sure that ultimately the assistance that we provide goes to the people of Afghanistan, those who are most in need. And that requires us to be very honest as WFP about what we do, the support we provide, um, any challenges that we ultimately face in doing so. At least with um, because of the scale and the fact that we provide a very much needed commodity, we as WFP have the ability to leverage some of that strength to make sure that the assistance we provide in our negotiations, for example, with the Taliban really goes to the people. Um, and in a way that is, you know, making sure the assessments and registrations um, are impartial and go to. Um, the last bit is also just showing change. I talked earlier about making sure that we have flexibility and agility in our response. Looking at that longer term and, and the fact that our response is dignified. So for example, we um, the other panelists have talked about supporting teachers. As WFP, we're not gonna provide salaries, but we also recognize that teachers are at the moment hungry because they haven't had salaries, they haven't received a salary for three to five months. Um, and so in the lo those locations that Minister Samar had mentioned, um, like in bulk state where they are providing secondary girls the opportunity to go to school, um, we're also looking at supporting those same teachers um, who are educating the next generation with food assistance. Um, and so it's really looking at that dignified and longer term response. At the end of the day, we don't want teachers to leave, migrate out of the country. We want them to be able to teach the next generation. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks very much. Um, all right, and as we start to run towards our time, Refugees International released um, a rapport with 10 recommendations for donors, United Nations and, and others to take. Can you? pick a couple that you think are the most essential. And, and since you released that report, have there been any um, advances or improvements or, you know, what, where, what's the state of play with some of those key steps that governments can take? And what should we think about for the, for the next steps? Jake, thanks very much. Um, just very quickly, I would say of that report, which um, I guess came out in September, uh, and we've done a couple of things in particular around women and girls, um, uh, in protection needs as well on the move uh, in and around Afghanistan. You know, there are a couple of things. One, we have seen some progress. We were pushing quite hard for to try to extend as long as possible, you know, the use of humanitarian parole, uh, pushing very hard for uh, significant increases in humanitarian assistance, um, some changes around leadership, appointing some people at a very senior level of US government uh, to take on sort of responsibility for coordinating the evacuee and refugee response. Um, uh, indications that we're going to have to see like an increase in the number of refugees who would be allowed into the United States writ large um, so that other countries don't pay the price for um, sort of the evacuation process. Uh, and so we've seen some of those, we've seen some progress there. But what I would say is, I mean, I have a couple of areas of concern moving forward that are still very much based uh, in that report. One, uh, first and foremost, is the opportunity for people, so it's protection for people on the move in and around Afghanistan and moving into the region. Like right now, you know, if, if and when we get to the point where people have exhausted their coping strategies and you know, despite WFP's extraordinary efforts to get food to as many people as possible, we find ourselves given the economy, the liquidity challenges, people need to move and they need to cross borders to get assistance. Right now, the state of play in terms of uh, the law, what the Pakistani and the Iranian authorities are doing will prohibit significant outflows of people to be able to find refuge on the other side. Now, part of this is uh, Pakistani and Iranian government policy. Part of this is resourcing them for success. So for example, if you take a very quick stroll through, for example, you know, the financial tracking system that the UN has on donor pledges going into Pakistan, you know, the pledges for the refugee response for this year are about 3% of what's needed, right? So clearly, yes, the situation in Afghanistan needs assistance, 
But if, if the airlift process taught us nothing, we need to be planning ahead, right? We need actually to prepare for what could be coming down the road. And if you, and if you follow the money, it's not keeping track with the capacity to build the capacity that's gonna be required to deal with a challenge we may be facing very, very soon. Um, I think the same goes for the sort of responses that we've seen from sort of other tra transit countries like Turkey or the European Union, where the sort of response has been very much one of, to get some aid in to Afghanistan, but also look potentially at, at keeping sort of borders closed. And, and that's just not the answer. In the United States, the piece that we're particularly focused on, right, is now that you have tens of thousands of people uh, who are, you know, in the U.S. and more coming Afghan evacuees who are coming in on humanitarian parole, we really, really, really need some sort of permanent pathway that gives them a process, you know, gives them the ability to become regularized inside the United States. Humanitarian parole is a temporary measure, right? And so the Afghan Adjustment Act, which is a piece of legislation that would do a lot of things, offers that uh, sort of permanent pathway. And we really need to see that piece worked on in Congress. Um, and finally, we would think that there needs to be an additional, what we call a P2, Priority 2 program for Afghan uh, refugees. Right now, there's one that exists for some people who came out as part of the airlift, but you have large numbers of people, uh, take women human rights defenders or women leaders, right, who now weren't, didn't work for the US government, didn't work with uh, uh, NGOs that were funded by the US government, who find themselves now in some other countries, uh, who have been evacuated, who managed to make their way out, they need a way to get to uh, a permanent status to be resettled in some sort of way. So I think we need to sort of work on the protection pathways, both in the region, in Europe, and then in the United States. Thanks, Hardin. I mean, what, what you're describing is, and I think all these these issues um, uh, is that we can't deal with this in a piecemeal way. I mean, there's a, a real a real challenge in Afghanistan in the neighboring countries, in the recipient countries of refugees and other asylum seekers. Um, there's a real challenge of balancing the human rights um, and humanitarian concerns. There's a challenge, as Ms. Lee talked about, balancing the needs today and thinking about the long-term. As we, as we run to our time, I wanna just turn back to you, Minister Samar, and, and give you the last word here. Um, you know, as you as you look to, to this audience of, United States policymakers, interested parties, I and mean, what is what is the departing message you would want to share as we collectively try to work through these issues? Mm -hmm. One, I think, uh, very short that we have to learn from our mistakes in the past. And secondly, the problem in Afghanistan will not stay in our boundary wall. We like it or not, it will reach everywhere the history has shown to us. Thirdly, from the lessons that we learn from Afghanistan, we should make our policies for the other countries for the future. Because uh, <laughs> let me say, put it this way, the fourth point that I would like to mention is empower the people. Democracy cannot be sent to a country or brought to a country by bombs and weapon and militarization. And finally, I would say that the, the COVID pandemic showed all of us that we cannot be, um, we cannot be uh, exclusively in, in our own country. We like it or not, it will reach to us and we have to, to um, work, uh, 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 put people in the center of our policy rather than uh, militarization uh, or uh, making new bombs and, and missiles. If it's Iran, if it's America, if it's, uh, if it's Israel, if it's uh, whoever they are, if it has Pakistan. So I stop here. And I think the human rights should be the center of everything. Thank you, um, Mr. Samara. It's a, a powerful um, closing. You know, you started with a powerful opening about, you know, resulting from failures and and collective failures. And I think we need to think about um, collective solutions and ways to prevent these things from happening in the future. So, um, Mr. Lang from Refugees International, Ms. Lee from World Food Program, Minister Samar. Um, and I was remiss to not acknowledge um, 
that this event today is in, in conjunction with my colleagues in the Project on Prosperity and Development, Dan Rundy directs that. Um, we're really grateful for your time, um, for your insights, and for all of you watching and, and viewing at home. We're, we're grateful for taking the time to be with us for your questions and, and for your contributions to this event and to the humanitarian um, response going forward. So with that, um, we'll close and wish you a good day and, and uh, have a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Jake.